full with any electronic devices that would be appreciated. Any uh, declarations of interest, financial or otherwise, related to today's business, now is the appropriate time to declare it. If not... Chair, sorry, can yes, I declare sorry. an interest in item 11? I have a family member who is a lay magistrate. Yep, no problem. We'll take note of that. Um, members agreed then the oral evidence sessions will be reported by Hansard. Agreed. There's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan. Um, joined on Starleaf with uh, Linda, Doug, Rachel, Sinead and Gemma. You're all very welcome. And if the clerk can just advise of any delegation of votes. Uh, under Standing Order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairman, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Um, draft minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of March. If members are content that they are a true reflection of proceedings, then I can sign them accordingly. Members agreed. Agreed. Um, matters arising. Uh, we had a, a useful meeting um, on the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme uh, yesterday with representative uh, victims groups. Um, a note of that meeting will be prepared and then circulated to all of the committee members. There was a range of issues that were discussed, um, including a request for clarity from the Secretary of State in respect of a recent statement around funding the payments um, from monies already set aside, and it was proposed that a further meeting then would be helpful in a number of months' time with this group. So there, there is a note being prepared, members, that will have some action points to it, but um, and that will get circulated, and we, we can come back to that. But the more immediate one that I would be keen just to, to get out there is writing to the Secretary of State for him to clarify um, his statement in respect of the potential funding for the scheme. There was a number of points raised around that particular aspect, and I'm keen to, to let that one go. And then we can pick up other issues that are identified in the note whenever we have that available. Uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to place on my record, first of all, um, to say that to thank the chair for facilitating that meeting. I think it was a very useful meeting, a very important meeting for, for us to, to do as a committee. Um, I think it was a, a very good engagement and, and Doug did make that point during the, the meeting that we should actually be doing more of it and, and potentially TEO as well, although it's not for us to tell TEO what to do, but I, I did think it was a very, very useful meeting and just want to place my record thanks to yourself for facilitating it. No, no problem. Um, Okay, and if, if members are content, we'll also on that issue write to represent the representatives to advise that the committee um, we would welcome another meeting then uh, in due course and whenever that becomes appropriate, we can uh, do that and they also can continue to engage directly with the committee and raise issues um, with us. If members are content, then we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, so pages 17 to 58 of the meeting pack, the committee commissioned two research papers, the first on removal um, or reform of the committal process in other jurisdictions, and the second was on statutory time limits that apply to custody and case proceedings in other jurisdictions um, to assist consideration of issues relating to the committal reform bill. So it's just there for noting members. The research papers have been completed and they will be there as a point of reference for members as we deliberate in due course on this bill. It will be added to the electronic bill folder and placed on the committee webpage, so it's there for noting. Then item five is the oral evidence session. Um, so we have officials here with us, so we'll invite them to come in, but um, officials are here to attend um, and discuss the key issues raised in the written and oral evidence that's been received by the committee. Uh, in respect of the committal reform bill and obviously then for members to tease these issues out further. The relevant papers, including a table which helpfully sets out the key issues in the Department's written response, are pages 60 to 194 of your meeting pack. Um, issues that members may wish to explore during the evidence session are also in the clerk's paper and they can be found on pages 3 to 6 of your table pack. Again, it helpfully highlights some issues that members may wish to follow up on. The committee had requested details of any analysis on the impact of the case management regs uh, provided for in the Justice Act of 2015. The Department's response again is in the tabled pack. It indicates that the general duty to 
progress criminal cases will not be commenced until draft regulations have been agreed and sets out a number of developments that have had an impact on the development of these regulations. The Department advises that work to develop an end-to-end -end case management framework with criminal justice partners is ongoing and that will help inform the regulations. So, members, if I can formally welcome uh, Glenn Capper, who is head of the Justice Performance Team um, within the Access to Justice Directorate, and also Laura Mallon, um, from the same area of the department. Uh, you're both very welcome to the meeting. Uh, it'll be recorded by Hansard, reported in due course through the normal processes. So, members, for your benefit, officials are going to take us um, take the, the clauses of the bill in turn. And given the similarity in the issues raised and the evidence received on clauses one and two, then we're going to group those two together for the purposes of a discussion. So. Officials are going to make uh, remarks um, in due course as we get to those clauses, and I'll take members um, at the appropriate point as well. So, Glenn, I think I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, Emma. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you for the opportunity to support the committee as it considers the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Um, as you have said, Chair, we thought it might be helpful to give a, a brief overview of our comments on each clause. So I'll maybe kick off by giving some comments on the, the general comments raised in the evidence session, um, and then we can pause and move through each clause one by one. Um, if it's any comfort, the comments on the general comments are maybe a bit longer than the, the, the subsequent ones. So uh, we'll, we'll start with those. Um, firstly, I think it's, it's important to note that powers to directly commit cases to the Crown Court have already been legislated for in the Justice Act of 2015. Uh, but as a reminder, there are three main aims of this bill. Firstly, the bill seeks to remove the need for oral evidence at the committal hearing, given the impact on victims and witnesses of giving sometimes traumatic oral evidence at both the committal hearing and then again at the Crown Court. Secondly, this bill seeks to get more cases more quickly to the Crown Court. And then finally, the bill deals with some technical issues to smooth the direct committal process. Uh, in relation to the comments received, it's pleasing to see that many positive and support, supportive comments uh, were received from a range of organisations and stakeholders. Uh, and then just to touch on some of the issues raised. Um, some organisations have indicated that reforms to the committal process alone will not reduce delays. Um, and we absolutely accept that. Speeding up justice is a challenging and complex issue, and the Department's leading a wide-ranging programme of work to deliver improvements. This bill is just one of many elements of work to speed up the system. But as I've already outlined, it's about more than just speed. It's about improving the experience of victims and witnesses on their journey through the system. Responses also touched on the need for more effective investigation and disclosure processes. Uh, I think it's important to highlight that the bill will facilitate this. Cases to be directly committed will be brought under the supervision of a Crown Court judge at an earlier stage, and that will allow earlier engagement, including with the defence, and will allow resources to be focused on areas in contention. Uh, as part of our Speeding Up Justice programme, we've already demonstrated the benefits of these principles through something called the Indictable, Co the Indictable Cases Process, which is based on early engagement. Similarly, the Disclosure Forum, set up and jointly led by police and PPS, is delivering improvements in the area of the disclosure of evidence. The Bar Council also referred in their comments to the need to have a more robust method of sharing digital evidence. Uh, as your papers show, and there's an annex that focuses on this, the Department is coordinating some innovative work on this area through a project to share digital evidence. And to date, nearly 6,000 digital cases have been created by police and shared via the cloud. There are also references to the resources required to deliver the changes outlined. Uh, recognising that this is a, a significant change to the justice system, we've established a multi-agency committal reform programme with projects covering legislation, legal aid, IT and business change, and we're also creating a stakeholder forum that will include the Bar Council, Law Society and Victim Support. In relation to costs, the main aim of direct committal is to transfer cases to the Crown Court more quickly at present, and therefore shorten the overall length of time it takes to complete these cases. It's intended that there will be a rebalancing of resources 
and a business case is being prepared to capture that relative rebalancing between justice organisations. Um, and hopefully that touches on some of the key issues raised in the comments from those who provided evidence. Uh, and of course, Chair, we're happy to answer any questions as the committee considers the clauses. Okay, thank you. So if you're happy, we'll turn to clauses one and two, and we shall pick up from there. Um, let me go with one of the questions then. In terms of considering uh, consideration to restricting oral evidence to technical or expert witnesses only at committal stage, and what might be the advantage for such an approach? So if you didn't have the victim, but you just restricted it, uh, you retained the oral commi the committal aspect of it, but we only got it from technical experts. Is that something that's been considered? Um, it's not. We, we, we've tried to sort of stay true to the, the fresh start recommendation of no oral evidence pre-trial. Um, I, I think the, the notion of just um, specialist evidence um, in some ways means that you have to retain the committal hearing in, in whatever form, and with that you lose some of the efficiencies of removing that process from the, the overall uh, process to get somebody to the Crown Court. So it, it's not something that we've looked at specifically. Okay. And was Fresh Start then, whenever that was published, was that the kind of catalyst for not commencing the interests of justice test when it came to the PIs or mixed committals? Yeah, I think w when we looked at Fresh Start, it, it, it reinforced the need to take a different approach to that outline in the 2015 Act and come back to that notion of uh, removing oral evidence completely. And I think that uh, th there's a number of, of recommendations for, from other areas that touch on this notion as well. Uh, I suppose it's back chair to that notion that uh, the, the prospect of, it's not just having to give oral evidence twice at the committal hearing and again at the Crown Court, it's also that notion of, of potentially having uh, to give oral evidence at the committal hearing is also a traumatic thing for victims. Um, Sir John Gillan refers to the fact that sometimes that uh, potential is there and then withdrawn at the last minute, and that is equally uh, damaging and traumatic for victims. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that argument. I suppose, from my perspective as an MLA, the Assembly had voted for something and it never really got an opportunity to, to see if it worked, um, because that was brought through the Assembly back in 2015 and it never actually was commenced. So there's a little bit of me that says, what's the point in the Assembly voting for something if the Department won't actually then enact it and then took the fresh start as a reason not to bring it forward? The fresh start was just an agreement. It wasn't the law. We had passed law. Yeah, I suppose on that, um, we viewed fresh start and the, the, the recommendations from it were accepted by the executive. So we took that executive uh, recommendation and said, well, let's work on this to, uh, to, to, to remove oral evidence altogether. But it's also worth reminding ourselves that um, when we talk about direct committal, direct committal will remove the committal hearing altogether. And by removing the committal hearing, we're removing oral evidence. So in some ways, the notion of oral evidence or not is arguably a time-bound argument, because as we seek to apply direct committal to all cases, there will be no committal hearing and therefore no oral evidence. So um, the long-term aim is to, to directly commit all cases. Okay. Um, finally, for me and then members, feel free to indicate and I'll bring you in. Um, is there consideration to a case management handbook similar to that described by the PPS as available in England and Wales? Um, the, the, the concept of case management is something that we've considered as a justice system with our, our justice partners. Um, there, there's different views on what case management should look like, uh, whether that's statutory case management or judicial case management and how proportionate and extensive those should be. Um, the, Sir John Gillan also comments on um, case management and suggests that uh, he's not in favour of introducing statutory case management. So what we've done, um, given those different views, um, just prior to the outbreak of, of COVID, the Criminal Justice Board 
uh, decided that we should try as a system and design something that we're calling a case management framework, which essentially tries to take um, the system as is and map on it some of the new initiatives that are making a difference to the speed of the system um, and overlay that with some of the existing times and, and targets in the system. And we think from that, that will help us design a better case management framework as a justice system that all the players in the system can sign up to. Okay. Well, listen, that's it for me. I'm not seeing any indication on clauses one and two from anybody else. So I'm happy to move on to the next clause. Okay. I'm not going to prolong this if I don't need to. Okay, Glenn. Um, if you want to... Okay, Chair, and if we follow the table that the committee received, I think we skipped to clause four, yes. if you're content. There were no issues on three, so four, yeah. Okay, so clause four in general deals with the operation of uh, direct committal. Uh, as I say, the process of going to the Crown Court without a committal hearing in the Magistrates Court. Um, if I take each subsection of clause four and turn on that, will maybe help navigate our way through things. So subsection four, uh, which is in your pack, mainly deals with expanding the range of offences that will be included as part of this first phase rollout of direct committal. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, the bill seeks to get more cases more quickly to the Crown Court in line with the range of external recommendations. Um, the Justice Act of 2015 only provided for murder and manslaughter cases to be directly committed. So the bill seeks to allow for all offences that, in the case of an adult, are triable only on indictment to be directly committed. Um, and apologies for the, the clunky description of that. That's what the, uh, the Office of Legislative Counsel suggested uh, we should best describe it as. Um, worth noting that that group of offences includes terrorism-related offences and serious sexual offences. Um, just to give you an indication, we estimate that that will make up about 25 or so percent, uh, 25 to 30 percent of the Crown Court caseload, which is about 370 cases uh, in 2019-20. So, in deciding on which offences should be included in the first phase rollout, um, we sought to strike a good balance between the number of cases that would give a meaningful first phase rollout and therefore help us evaluate that to inform future rollouts and also ensuring that the rollout could be successfully managed um, and we didn't swamp the system given the changes it will bring. Uh, I'll maybe comment at this stage about how extra cases would be added. That was something that was raised in the evidence. Um, the 2015 Act provides for a small number of offences to be added by way of a draft affirmative re resolution. We've confirmed with the Office of Legislative Council, and, and this can only be applied for a limited number of offences, uh, for example, those linked to other legislative and policy developments. It's our intention to fully rule out direct committal over time for all cases, and as we do that, we will need uh, further primary legislation, uh, so that obviously will bring with it the associated committee <coughs> scrutiny. Okay, thank you. <coughs> in terms of the Crown Court Judiciary, um, regarding their involvement in case management in a large number of cases at an earlier stage, has there been any conversations with them at that stage to help? Yeah, um, as part of the committal reform programme that I mentioned, we have uh, stakeholders from across the system represented, uh, and that includes representatives from the Office of the Lord Chief Justice, um, Laura and the team over recent weeks and months have been working to design Crown Court rules that will put the detail as to how direct committal will operate and as part of that process um, colleagues from the Office of the Lord Chief Justice are on that so there's very much input as to how judges will operate this in practice. And that group um, includes people from PPS courts, Office for Lord Chief Justice, and a, a wide variety of, of other organisations to be involved. Um, it's also um, useful now that we have the stakeholder forum, um, where the Bar and Law Society um, will also get a chance to have input to things like the Crown Court Handling Arrangements and things like that. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Lynn, you'd mentioned about rolling this, rolling this out so that all cases. <coughs> is there a time frame as to when you would be wanting to assess this change has been made, what adjustments need to be carried out to make it more effective, and what's this, the kind of timeline for, for getting to that full 100% point? Yeah, I suppose as context of that, Chair, we understand that uh, implementing direct commit lending in Wales took about 10 years. Um, it, it's not our intention that it will take that long. In some ways, uh, I'm reluctant to put a timeline on it because one of the things we're very conscious of is that this first phase will be a pilot. Um, but what we have done is made sure that we have captured, our, we've set up plans to capture the benefits of the pilot and to evaluate it. So whenever direct committal has operated for uh, 18 to 24 months, we'll be in a position to evaluate that, understand what's worked well, what needs to change. And I think that's the, the appropriate point to plan the next phases of the rollout, because we'll get an indication from that about whether uh, future rollouts should be done in a sort of big bang approach to bring all cases in, or whether there's two or three further rollouts. But I envisage we'll be talking about two or three phases of rollout rather than a, a sort of 10-year approach. Okay. And fa finally, for me, Glenn, just, um, so if you take the probation board, probably an in maybe an increased burden on pre-sentencing reports and so on, the kind of resource implications for that, has that been thought through as to what that <coughs> could entail? Yeah, I'm um, conscious that probation board um, flagged a concern along those lines in their evidence. Um, we've since met with probation board to discuss that. Just as a bit of background, um, the ability to order pre-sentence reports is currently allowed for, but that actually happens very infrequently. So we've got some stats. Five reports were requested in 2019 and four in 2020. So it, it's a small number of reports. However, we anticipate that there will be an increase in the request for those reports. But in developing the, the bill, we did consider that. Um, and we have factored an additional safeguard in the bill. So that safeguard requires the court to give an opportunity for both prosecution and defence to make representations to the court before making the request for the reports. And in so doing, that should hopefully ensure that reports are only ordered when all parties have agreed there's a benefit in doing that to what stops uh, an avalanche of reports uh, coming. So I think that's uh, our, our sense is that the best way to manage that resource issue and hopefully that provides assurance to, to the probation board. Okay, thank you. Um, that finishes me on clause four, which is obviously the substantive part of the bill, but um, and then I'm going to go into just a couple of general points. All through. Mine's all general, so if you want to go first here, I don't Yeah, mind. so in, in particular to clause four, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Just in relation to the, the potential for the backlog moving rather than, than stopping, but move, actually moving to the Crown Court, what measures have been put in place to mitigate against that? And I know obviously you've said that there'll be, um, <coughs> rather than new resources, there'll be resources moved within, you know, from one court to another. But I mean, I just, I'm just wondering what other measures have been put in place to mitigate against that? Uh, thank you. I got a, a, a really um, pertinent question. Um, I suppose there's a number of angles to that. Uh, if, if I talk about resources and Crown Court rules firstly, um, one of the key things to making direct committal work well in practice uh, will be making sure that we design the right Crown Court rules, which are essentially the processes that will happen in practice uh, to move cases through the system. Uh, that is a specific piece of work that all relevant organisations are involved in. I've mentioned through a, a work stream that uh, Laura's leading uh, through the business change element of her programme. Uh, so we will, we will involve all organisations in that and make sure that those are as effective as possible. Um, in terms of the resources, I, I've mentioned that w we view this as a rebalancing. I don't think we're at all saying that direct committal will save resources. We know that it will take resources and savings out of some areas, 
So there will be obviously less spend on committal hearings because we're removing committal hearings in a large number of cases. Um, but we envisage that funding being reinvested into uh, the Crown Court stage to help progress things as, as efficiently as possible. Uh, but that is a big piece of work. And once we've got the, 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 the final shape of the bill, that will allow us to finalise those Crown Court rules um, and agree the operations of cases with our criminal justice partners. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, do you mind if I ask just a, a couple of sh brief general yes. questions? Yes, of course, than... Okay, thank you. Appreciate your leeway in relation to it. Um, just in, first of all, in relation to the, um, I suppose that there, there has been some issues raised, obviously, by, by the Bar Council and others in, in relation to where will the facility be to look at what is not relevant whenever you get to court and I know obviously that's that's the intention is that will be looked at the Crown Court. I'm just wondering is there potential or have you looked at the new piece of legislation in the 26 counties around preliminary hearings and is that something that might be a potential to, to deal in with, with that specific issue? Um. Yeah, we did indeed look at, I think it's the, the Criminal Procedure Bill 2021. So we looked at that bill, um, and what that seems to be suggesting is the introduction, as you've said, preliminary trial hearings. And our understanding of that is that those aren't the equivalent of a committal hearing. Those preliminary trial hearings will be held in the court where the trial will be held, so equivalent to our Crown Court. So if you like, they're not putting in a committal hearing that we're taking out. Um, so to go back to the first part of your question, that early engagement, which we think is gonna be one of the, the most fundamental pieces of direct committal, um, and the early engagement will help the right parties get together uh, more quickly to narrow issues and <coughs> progress a case in a more proportion, proportionate way. That will happen at the very beginning of the Crown Court hearing. Um, and I, I think we can build something akin to the preliminary trial hearing in the Criminal Procedure Bill um, into our Crown Court rules. So th that is something that through those rules, we'll be able to maybe not exactly reflect, but, but build into what we're currently doing um, so it, just to assure you, our understanding is that isn't akin to having a, a committal hearing. And our experience of the committal hearing uh, is that it certainly isn't a forum to have that narrow, narrowing of issues led by a judge that getting a case to the Crown Court sooner will help with. Sorry, Chair, just to clarify, I, I absolutely I know it's not akin to a committal hearing. and. and I would be somebody that's supportive of probably more in supportive than against in relation to the committal reform and to this bill. So um, that, that's why I was asking about the preliminary here and, and, and you've actually you've answered my question in that. So the, the Crown Court is really the place where that, where the equivalent of that will happen is really, if I'm, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's our understanding yeah. of the bill, yes. Okay. That, that, that's helpful, Chair. If, if I have any further questions, I can I can ask to come in at a later stage. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Linda. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Yeah, great. Um, I suppose just leading on from that, because I am trying to understand better the this rebalancing of resources. There's no real speak of extra resources. Um, and in terms of the rebalancing piece, I, is it fair to assume that there may also be a, a drive downwards to the PPS where they may have to pick up extra, um, <coughs> an extra role or you know, additional work on this? And if so, do you anticipate them having some of the rebalancing of resources? And I suppose I'd like to understand the the bill as it is presented now. Um, I understand what you're saying about um, the court, you know, and the, and the <coughs> what would be established in terms of the court piece. But has there been a scope and exercise to to really follow through 
where that piece of work will go, you know, because some of that committal work will happen, but it'll just be in a different place and in a, in a different way and hopefully in a more speedily and effective way. But where will it be? And are there cost implications to it? Thank you. OK, uh, if I try to tackle that in, in, in two parts, um, in relation to the PPS, um, <coughs> I suppose if we, if we take a step back, uh, direct committal won't add extra work to the overall process um, of, of hearing a case. Direct committal will remove work from the magistrate's court, um, but not all of that work will in essence transfer to the Crown Court. So uh, I suppose what we're saying is a lot of work that happens through a committal hearing will no longer need to happen at any stage because that's a, a step that we're taking out. We're putting a case straight to the Crown Court. Um, no doubt some work that happens in a committal hearing will need to be replicated in the Crown Court, but certainly not all. So it's not the sense that we're taking a block of work from the Magistrates' Court and moving that same block of work to the Crown Court. Um, th that block of work, in an awful lot of cases, won't need to happen because what we've demonstrated that the committal hearing um, arguably in some ways doesn't contribute to a, a more effective process. Um, in relation to PPS, I suppose if we, if we take that notion and apply it to the PPS, um, the PPS will therefore have fewer committal hearings to service um, because those committal hearings won't happen. And there's two aspects to that in the bill. One is, um, we won't have oral evidence at the committal hearing for those cases that won't yet be directly committed. And we know that committal hearings that proceed via oral evidence take, I guess, three or four times more um, days and resource than a case that proceeds purely on, on paper at committal. Uh, and then for a, a significant chunk of cases, there won't be a committal hearing at all because those cases would be directly committed. So focusing on PPS, they therefore won't have that work to do at the magistrate's court. Uh, the piece of work that we're focusing on now, and as I've said, we can't really finalize this work until we know what the final bill looks like, is how the, the court process will therefore operate in the Crown Court. And that is a, a very, a uh, labour-intensive piece of work, very detailed piece of work that we're, we're progressing with all of our criminal justice partners, and that will work through, therefore, what pieces of work, and if there is, what additionality there might need to be in the Crown Court, um, and that will be captured as part of the ongoing work on Crown Court rules, and then factored into a, a final business case that will seek to map out that rebalancing that I've, I've spoken of. So hopefully that goes some way to uh, to address your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, and, and I suppose I just am a little bit concerned that without that piece being completed, is there a danger that we're removing one process? And I think there's you know good arguments for removing that process, but on the other hand, we're not prepared um, for how that's going to actually work out in the courts. And I think I'll, I'll sort of come back to my point that building that um, picture has a, a range of steps. Um, and until we have the final bill, um, it, it's difficult to complete those Crown Court rules and know exactly how things are going to operate. But what, we, what we're seeking to do at the minute is to model those savings that will be generated from having no committal hearings um, and having no oral evidence. Um, and then looking at how we best reinvest that funding in the Crown Court element of work. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I will look further into that because it is that connecting of those, those two pieces of work that I, I just don't feel fully informed of, or certainly the timeline of it concerns me. I imagine that they would have had to have a, an almost a handshake, if you like, but... That doesn't appear to be the place there could be a block of time where they don't meet each other. And I will look into it further, but thank you. That's been really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, Rachel Woods and then Gemma Dolan. Rachel Woods. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Thank you. Um, thank you, Glenn and Nora. Thank you for your comments so far. Um, I have a number of general points just uh, in relation to this. Um, and, and just in picking up from where Sinead had said about costings and resourcing, how much does committal cost at the moment? Do we have any um, idea? Yeah, we do. Laura, you have some numbers, do you? What we can give some. What we're doing a modelling, and this is all um, approximations. I can't give you the full cost of the committal, for example, uh, PPS cost. But we've been doing some modelling in relation to the legal aid elements of committal, um, and that is. And if we don't have it, we'll come back to you in writing. No, that, that's fine. No, I appreciate that. Sorry, it's just that um, just, we're talking about costings and saving money and rebalancing resources. Would yeah. be just you know what, what we're actually talking about here. And will that actually fill a gap? Um, and I appreciate there's a legal aid element. There's also the cost then of the actual processes that we're looking to abolish. And I know you have said before that there was a business case been worked on. Um, and certainly I would appreciate that um, for, the, for myself and, and for the committee to have a look at to see what, what does this actually look like um, and what, what we're actually talking about here. Um, and just you said about how the final bill looks like and just wondering, is there an intention of changing what's in the bill at the moment or is that sort of up to the Assembly's scrutiny processes and what the committee may be looking to do or not do? Oh, no, I spoke for, from the department's point of view, we're... we're we're hoping there'll be no changes to the bill. But no, I, I, I'm simply referring to the, 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 the right and proper process that the bill will go through. Okay, so there's no, there's no um, sort of amendments being considered to come in in the consideration stage that we're not aware of or anything? Not, not, not from Laura and I, know. No. Okay, no worries. No, that's fine. It's just so I know. Um, um, certainly, um, the issues of fees and legal aid, I would just appreciate a wee bit more um, detail, if you have any, about the, the fees and legal aid issues and how they're been resolved and looked at, and if we have any sort of costing or model of how that's going to work yet. Okay, we'll, we'll come back in writing on that. Great, thank you. Um, and one thing, I know Glenn, I've, I've spoken to you about this before, in terms of the um, appointment of barristers and the appointment of council, um, that would have taken place at the committal stage. Um, so the appointment of a barrister, would that then follow on from the first day by the PPS, you know, at the same time, so PPS appoints council, would the defence then be appointing council at the same time? And would the legal aid certificates then be issued at that stage? Yes. Okay. They would, yeah. Great. It would be necessary to, um, for our ongoing plan so that they can start those conversations um, about case management. So, yes. Okay. Great. So, um, sorry, I appreciate there's been a few questions there to come back on, but that's it for the moment, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Gemma Dolan. Chair, you're okay. Thank you. My questions have been answered. Super. Paul Frey. Yes, thank you. Uh, Glenn. More general comments. So, we know what this bill is supposed to do, and it's to help smooth out a process and to help with delay. We're struggling to find proof that it will solve delay, which is one of the main planks for doing it in the first place, one of the main reasons for doing it. Is there anywhere, any jurisdiction in this world where you know that the removal of PIs and committal process has led to a speeding up of justice? I suppose a few comments on that. Um, as I noted at the start, we're, we're totally not saying that direct committal will solve delay. There are many, many, many elements to, to speeding up the justice system, and this is one part of it. Um, I'll also go back to my opening comments. Um, I suppose th this bill isn't necessarily about direct committal. Direct committal has been legislated for in, in 2015. This is about putting more cases through, and, and as importantly, if not more importantly, um, seeking to remove oral evidence again. Um, it, it's very difficult comparing different systems. Uh, what we do know is, and I may be able to find it, um, the Audit Office in England and Wales, uh, in a report on the complete abolition of committal pr proceedings there, stated that uh, the abolition of committal hearings 
has reduced waste in the system by getting rid of a hearing that added little value. Um, so I think that gives us assurance that where direct committal has been applied elsewhere, um, it adds value. In terms of the specifics about the difference it will make, I think an awful lot of that comes down to the court rules that will follow the bill that will outline exactly how and when a case will move through the system. Yeah, and I get that. And, and again, if you're looking at this in a primitive view, you would come to a conclusion very quickly without looking at any evidence that it's bound to speed up our process, uh, albeit with so many complicated working parts along that process. And that's a very primitive view, of course, but it's just that we are struggling to find any evidence whereby it will just speed up justice by, by a natural course. But I do get the merit of it because of the impact that it could well have on some people having to give oral evidence more than once. So I, I get that, and, and I'm quite supportive of the move and the bill. What I suppose I'm getting at is, are we sure that we're hitting this with as much as we can at this stage to do enough to help that experience for people and also to quicken up the process? So I think we've heard you say a couple of times today that it, it, this in itself won't do it, and we need more things to happen. We need other things to, to be in place, one of them being the procedures, one of them being case management and all of that. And that can't really be determined yet until you, until you get through this first step. So are we missing a trick by not adding something into this bill that will help and assist and strengthen the, the, the advantages and the hope that it will speed up? and smooth out the process. Uh, what I'm getting at is, have you looked at, as a department, uh, statutory time limits uh, for custody or bail? Um, statutory time limits, uh, well, I suppose to answer your, your, your first question, um, I think in terms of this bill, um, and, and your question was, have we done enough in it? I think by seeking to completely abolish oral evidence, that's as much as we can do on that. In terms of getting more cases directly committed to the Crown Court, so getting cases there more quickly, um, the, the bill has an awful lot more cases going to the Crown Court directly than the 2015 Act had. Um, I, I would urge that we sort of strike that right balance, as I said earlier, between putting too many cases now and swamping the system because we need to learn um, and getting enough cases there so that we can evaluate and properly learn for future phases. So our sense is that bill strikes the right balance. In relation to things like statutory time limits, we have looked at the experience elsewhere. Um, I, I think an awful lot of, uh, about how we're going to speed up the system is about culture. Uh, and I think one of the things that this bill does is make sure that we get a case to the Crown Court quicker, and when it gets there, that's the place to have judicial oversight of the case and bringing the right people together early to narrow issues, which can't happen in the Magistrates' Court. Um, we, we looked at statutory time limits and their operation in England and Wales and Scotland. Um, England and Wales piloted them a few times and came to the conclusion that for various reasons that they don't work in Scotland, I think, came to the same conclusion. Yes, um, statutory time limits, England and Wales piloted a few times and found that administratively it was um, it, it was an added burden. Um, and quite often you have to put a process in whereby it's almost a, a, an exceptional extension. case as an extension. And that was being overused. Um, and so it, it reduced the value of the statutory time limits to a certain extent. I think Scotland's case has been a bit more successful. However, I think they would really find it difficult to disaggregate between what was the sort of improvements from statutory case management, or, or, sorry, statutory time limits, and other things that they have done with, in the area of case management. And I think the two <coughs> coupled together um, has helped the Scottish situation. In terms of Northern Ireland, um, there is legislation in place um, for statutory time limits. Um, the, Piece, exact piece. It's 2003, I think, is the criminal justice order, but I can uh, get the specific piece of legislation. It allows statutory time limits to be put in place um, between a charge or decision made by PPS up to the point of trial. Um, uh, so there is something there already 
that uh, could potentially be used. We don't need to add anything into the bill, I suppose, is what but I'm they've saying. Never been, they've never been used. No, right? as far as I am aware, they haven't uh, been. And I think, uh, is there a reason why they haven't been used? I think, I, I think for the... the sorry, no, Lynn, I think it's just from, from seeing the experience of other places and that it hasn't been of, of, uh, of huge benefit, really. I think you'll also be familiar with Sir John Gillan's review on serious sexual offences, and he commented on statutory time limits in that review, and he found that evidence suggests that they've, uh, and to quote, little or no impact, um, and that's for a couple of reasons. I think um, requests for extensions. So if, if you reach your time limit, in an awful lot of cases, you request an extension, and also, as Laura said, that extra work that's required to monitor and administer them. Um, so uh, as I say, I think that an awful lot of the solutions to the justice system are about culture change, yeah. and, and this goes an awful long way towards but, that. But how do you ever change culture without squeezing and pressurising it to the point where you, you mould and shape it and change it to a better system? Because we can all talk about culture, but it will just remain the same unless there's pressure applied and it's forged in some way. Uh, and I'm just thinking, is this one instrument that could be used? And, and I get that even at the start, there will be a, not a repelling of it, but there will be a bulking at it to the point where you would be gaining, most cases will seek extension. But surely if over a period of time, and you did say the culture had to change over 10 years, I think, in England with regards well, that, to... Well, that's the length of time it took them to fully get, get direct committal in. Yes, so even 10 years for direct committal. If you were putting in an <coughs> instrument like statutory time limits, surely you're setting down a marker and a standard uh, that is acceptable and not acceptable, and then that would be the point whereby you could measure this, because ultimately we're going to have to measure the success of this bill one way or the other, and that may well be one way of pivoting it and and trying to register it. And I, th I think that the issue with statutory time limits is the fact that they're statutory, so it's very rigid, um, and it takes a great deal to change that process once it's set in place. And getting something meaningful and put in place at, at the right time um, is important. And at this precise moment, what we're doing through direct committal is a huge change, really, to how our courts process these types of cases. Um, to put anything in at this precise moment um, around that is an unknown factor. Um, and it would be very difficult to estimate really what a meaningful statutory time limit would look like in relation to these cases. I think, we, as Glenn said earlier, this first phase feels very much like a pilot as such of the direct committal process, and there's a lot of learning to be made from that. Um, as I said, the legislation's there. If we feel that um, cases aren't progressing, it's another, I suppose, another tool um, that we could use if it is needed. Um, what is what is the what is the average time for uh, Crown Court? I know I know that's a very probably an unfair detailed question because there's so many types of offence. It uh, and I'm, I'm going to start the answer on healthy by saying it depends, but yes. it, it depends on t two main things: whether the case progresses via a charge route where police charge you, yes. um, and that is quicker than um, the other route, which is if you're summoned to court and a summons case takes longer. Um, Laura, I see, has a page that has some of those numbers helpfully on it. So. I do. Uh, not all the numbers, and we can provide more. I, I think it's important. One thing that we've put in place over the last number of years um, are performance yes. um, stats, and that does an end-to-end -end performance data um, across the system. So taking right from the report um, at, um, in... Um, PSNI through to the end stage. So for a typical Crown Court case, um, it'll take about 565 days, and that is from the start of the investigation right the way through to the very end. Um, charge cases are seem to go a bit quicker than summons cases are, are much longer, and they're ones that we do need to look at a bit more, um, and that's on our plan of work as an area to research more specifically. Um, the actual court stage um, at the very end. I don't have those figures, but I'm more than happy to share those with you. But it's not a lengthy period of time. That actually is quite a small chunk of that 565 days. The bulk of that will be in the investigatory stages. 
at the early part. That time duration also include sentencing? It takes right up to sentencing, yeah. So the disposal at court would be when the case is sentenced or discharged. Is there is bound to be a rights issue here too with regards to people uh, in custody? Um, in terms of on remand? Mm, oh, sorry, on remand, yep. yep. So, you know, there's a time issue there with regards to people being incarcerated uh, without bail and having to get speedy justice. Um, so that in itself is en should be enough motivation to try and speed up the justice system. Oh, yeah, indeed. H how, how are you going to measure the success of this bill? Uh, as part of our programme of work, we have a benefits realisation um, mechanism in place. Um, so we've identified a range of benefits uh, that we will manage and how we will evaluate those. So if, if you're content, we'll, we'll send you through details of the various things that we're going to evaluate. But it, it does include things like speed, cost, um, etc, etc. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Linda, are you indicating there just to come back in? Yeah. It, it's actually kind of been covered in some of the, the last points made in relation to the um, time limits and, and I do see that I, even from the research in Scotland and Australia the the extensions are, are quite prevalent so um, no, I appreciate some of the points that have, have been highlighted there so it, it has answered it Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well I don't have any other points and I don't see any other members raising any other issues at this stage so on that basis, can I thank Glenn and Laura for coming to the committee? It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Back after Easter, we'll yes, see you we again. will. <laughs> okay, members. So we will take um, informal deliberations on provisions of the bill at our meeting on the twenty second of April. Is whenever we're going to go through that process. That will then establish whether members are content with each clause as drafted or whether members wish to consider any possible amendments. So. The Department's response to the summary of the evidence table and associated papers will be added to the electronic bill folder and also the committee pages. So, members, we'll um, go through that informal deliberation on the 22nd of April. Okay, then I will move on to item six on the agenda. Um, there's officials joining us through the Starley facility to outline the key issues covered in the post-consultation report of the second statutory review of the Magistrates uh, Courts and County Court Appeals, Criminal Legal Aid Costs Rules and the relevant papers are pages 196 to 240. So hopefully I am able to uh, welcome officials uh, to the meeting. Um, yeah, I think you're in okay. It's maybe a blank screen from our end. So I am told yeah. if someone was able to turn it off and on at your end, that would allow us to get a visual if you were able to try that. Thanks, Stephen. Great. Yep, we can see you now. Um, okay, well, the session will be recorded by Hansard and then that'll be published uh, on the committee webpage in due course. So, Stephen, I'm going to hand over to you. And rather than me introduce your team, I'll let you introduce your own team. And then if you want to give us just an outline of the key issues in terms of this post-consultation report. Thanks, Stephen. Great, Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Will do. So I, I have... Uh, on this side, I'm just sort of pointing at Jill Trainer, who's the, the head of branch, and Ruth O'Donnell on the other side, uh, so uh, who's the project manager for this. So I'll be brief, Chair, uh, in my opening remarks. So we're here today, as you say, to, to provide the committee with an oral briefing on the post consultation report on the, uh, the, the statutory review of the Snapoli titled Magistrates Court and County Court Appeals, Criminal Legal Aid, Costs Rules, Northern Ireland 2009. 
Um, we'll take on board any points the committee wants to make before publishing the post-consultation report in the next few weeks. Um, by way of background, the 2009 rules introduced a standard fee approach to remuneration for publicly funded defence representation in criminal proceedings in the Magistrates' Court and in criminal appeals from the Magistrates' Court to the County Court. This approach was intended to ensure on a swings and roundabouts basis appropriate remuneration uh, for work, work undertaken and to simplify the scheme in terms of the submission and processing of claims. The first statutory review of the 2009 rules began in, in July 2012 and culminated in the introduction of the Magistrates Court and County Court Appeal uh, Rules, the two, 2014 rules to keep it simple. The 2014 rules revoked provisions in the 2009 rules relating to guilty plea two fees and very high cost cases while also introducing a number of additional fees identified during the course of that statutory review. So since that first statutory review, the 2009 rules have been subject to further amendment in order to make provision for remuneration in exceptional cases. These amendments were introduced in 2016 uh, and came into operation in December of that year. The 2016 rules prescribe hourly rates of payment where an application for a certificate of exceptionality is granted in an individual case in order to undertake additional preparation work. So this is where um, there was a considerable amount of work and it escaped from the, the standard fee. There was too much work to pay through a standard fee. So this second statutory review that we're here to, to talk about today of the 2009 rules complies with the statutory requirement to carry out a regular review of the rules. The review has included engagement with all relevant stakeholders and the feedback received throughout the consultation process has influenced the proposals contained in the post-consultation report. In terms of the proposals in your pack, I'll just briefly highlight the, the key ones. The review has recommended four amendments to the 2009 rules. Uh, firstly, the introduction of a new fixed fee for hearings relating to applications for registered intermediaries. Secondly, an increase to the existing fee for remuneration of counsel in appeals against sentence to the county court. Thirdly, an increase to the existing fee for remuneration of Newton hearings, and these are relatively rare hearings where a defendant has pleaded guilty, but the facts that will be used to determine the sentence are disputed. And finally, a reset of the statutory review period. Three of these four proposals have financial implications and the estimated cost of implementing these in total is in the region of £100,000 per financial year. To put this in some context, this represents an estimated 0.6% of the average annual gross total expenditure on legal aid in the Magistrates Court. Following publication of the post-consultation report, the Department will undertake a targeted consultation with the statutory consultees and key stakeholders on the draft amending rules. Once that process has been completed, the Department will then return to the Committee seeking to make the regulations which are subject to the negative resolution procedure. That will, will happen either uh, hopefully in late in June or early in September. Thank you, Chair. We look forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and I'm pretty content with the travel of direction on this one, um, so I don't really have a lot to, to quiz you on. I suppose one of just a process question is, um, I don't think the Law Society actually um, responded to, the, to these proposals, and I know that was one of the issues before the Department had indicated um, being reluctant to, to proceed. So uh, did they respond? They didn't. Um, Chair, when, when I took up post in 2019, a couple of months after that, I wrote to them again, and I've raised it in a few meetings with them, and they still haven't responded. So they will obviously have an opportunity when we consult on the, the amending rules. They were engaged in the pre-consultation back in 2017, um, and they put a number of uh, points forward, uh, some of which have been taken forward uh, in the consultation and are now things that we're recommending. Um, so we don't anticipate there being major issues, but it, it is unfortunate that they, they didn't uh, respond, but it's not for want of trying on our part. Yeah, okay. Um, and then finally, for me, the, the difference between the contest fee recommended by the Bar Council and then your proposal of the 75% payable on the standard guilty fee plea for Newton hearings in the Magistrates Court, can you elaborate on, on what the difference is from the, on those two positions? Yes. Um, 
It's basically to take account in, in, the, in the Crown Court where there's a similar provision, um, the, the Newton hearings are, are taken forward by, uh, are paid by a full contest fee, which is what the bar wanted in, in these cases. However, the process is very different in the Crown Court and we felt it wasn't an, an analogous position. So we've reflected their view that, that more remuneration was needed uh, to, to represent fair remuneration in these cases, but we don't think it's as high as, as a full contest. So it's a 75% uplift rather than a 50% uplift. But obviously, Chair, that can be tested at the um, targeted consultation. So if further evidence comes forward, obviously we can, we can change that. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, bring in some members, Rachel Woods and then Sinead Bradley. Oh, maybe Rachel was from before. It's okay if we can bring Rachel into the spotlight. Thanks, Chair. Um, no, that was one of my questions was, have we received a response from the Law Society yet? So that's been covered. Um, but thank you for, for um, your answer so far. Can I just ask, what is a contest fee? Um, I'll, I'll perhaps ask Ruth to, to cover that. Yeah. So a contest fee, it depends on the category of offence. So a contest fee for a summary offence would be £470 for a solicitor or counsel. Um, a contest fee for hybrid or indictable tribal summarily would be 590 for a solicitor or 550 for a counsel. And for indictable only, it's £600 for a solicitor and £600 for a barrister. But the no. contest fee in the, in the context of Newton hearing is basically where there's a disputed set of facts. So the, the, the defendant has pled guilty, uh, pleaded guilty, um, but there's disputed facts that would affect the sentence. So it's a there's a contest in the sense that there's a there's a, an argument about about the facts that the, the 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 judge should take into account when sentencing the defendant. Okay, no, well, thank you. That's um, out of interest. Um, I just following on from our previous um, questions with Glenn on committal reform. Is there any implications for the committal reform and if the legislation passes with regard to this legal aid provision? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the magistrate's court rules will need to be amended to reflect uh, committal reform because obviously there will be no, there wouldn't be no committal uh, as such uh, for, for a number of offences. So yes, both magistrates and crime court rules, uh, legal aid rules will need to be amended. And we have a project set up uh, with uh, another one of our colleagues, Chris Barry, who's going to lead that reporting to me. We can't do a, a whole lot of work on that at this stage because we need the bill to be settled. Uh, and we also need some indication of what the, um, the, the rules will be, the, the court rules. Once those are a bit clearer, then we can, we can get cracking. But yes, there will need to be amendments both to these rules and the equivalent rules in the Crown Court. Okay, thank you. No, that's all for me, sort of trying to tie the two things together. So this, we will, the committee itself will have another, we'll, we'll have another rake of these coming through if the committal legislation goes through. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. That's all for me, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, Sinead, your hand is down, so that must have been from earlier. Um, oh, let's back up. Okay, if we bring Sinead into the spotlight, thank you. Sorry, yes, Chair, appreciate that. Um, yes, it, it was. It was the joining of those two items that Rachel uh, correctly pointed out, and the. It, it just seems that there was a very disproportionate um, in terms of. I'll take for example the one where we look at the um, council for appeals against sentence at the county court. So that's gone from one hundred and fifteen to two hundred and thirty. So it's doubled. Um, yes. Are there any other? Likelihood. I mean, that that seems to have been a very wide gap. How did that come about in the first place? And does this now correct all over the justice system that that, that these sort of gaps aren't gathering up or building momentum going forward? Yes, I mean, and one of the purposes we we have in in all legal aid remuneration legislation, we have a statutory duty to conduct the statutory reviews for the very reason that you've highlighted. Um, that there will be things that change over time um, and we have four statutory criteria that we have to take into account. Um, so as part of our pre-consultation, the bar raised this as, as an issue where they felt remuneration was no longer fair 
because the, the work that they were doing was was far above what the, the £115 fee would, would cover. So it's something that that's the whole purpose of these statutory reviews is to address these issues. Um, and um, and there will be another one. So it's, it's meant to be every three years. This one was a wee bit delayed, but uh, that's the, the very purpose of them. Yes, thank you. So I just wondered, you know, if it, this one was a bit longer, but that's a very wide um, gap to have gone sort of unnoticed, you know, and then to have to jump in at a level where you have to double it seems a bit extreme. But I suppose then I am also very conscious, and you have touched on it to be fair with Rachel, where the landscape might change in terms of what is expected to happen within some of these roles and the duties within these roles and the speed of which people are going to be required to work. It could be very different. And Absolutely. I suppose there's no point in preempting, you know, but I imagine then that there could be another very significant change to how this review would be carried out going forward. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of in terms of committal, I'll maybe ask Jill just to talk a little bit about the, the statutory criteria, but there are four statutory criteria set out under the, the, the parent legislation, the primary legislation, that we must take into account when setting legal aid rates. Um, so uh, those will be the criteria that determine uh, where we go on committal reform as well. So Jill, do you just want to kind of briefly take, take the committee through those? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, as Stephen said, there is a, a requirement for us to keep the general operation of the, the rules under review um, and that um, the statutory review period is three years um, and that requires us to consider the criteria included in the 1981 um, Legal Aid Advice and Assistance Order. Um, so that very much is the, the primary purpose of um, each statutory review um, of the rules. And it's the time and skill involved in a case, it's value for money, it's the, the level of expertise that is needed um, and, uh, and, and the cost of the provision. So we need to balance those four competing um, um, criteria then when determining appropriate remuneration. So when something as fundamental as committal reform comes in, we'll need to look afresh at uh, the kind of work that will be needed to, to deliver uh, that. And, it may be a tweak, it may not, but we'll need to conduct research to test those four criteria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. If there's no one else, then um, that's fine. We can note it at this stage, and obviously as it comes forward, um, we can pick the issues up again um, when the statutory rule comes. So, Stephen, can I, can I thank you and your team? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. All right. Thank you. Okay, members. Well, obviously, um, we will pick this up in due course whenever it comes forward by way of the proposed statutory rule. Um, if I can move on then to the next item on the agenda, item seven is the protection from the stocking bill. Uh, the Department has provided a delegated powers memorandum which identifies the provisions in the protection from stocking bill that confer powers to make delegated legislation and outlines the reason for taking each power and the nature of it. Uh, to assist the Committee's consideration of the delegated powers in the Bill, normal practice would be to forward the memorandum to the examiner for statutory rules and to seek her views on whether it is appropriate for each of the powers outlined in the memorandum to be left to subordinate legislation rather than being included in the Bill itself and whether the choice of Assembly control provided for each power is the most appropriate. So if members are content, we will refer the Delegated Powers Memo to the Assembly Examiner of Statutory Rules for a report highlighting any issues that the Committee then may wish to consider. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Item 8 is uh, the draft budget, pages 252 to 268. The Department has provided the information requested by the Committee on the issues raised by members regarding the potential impacts of the draft budget allocations for the Department's um, non-departmental non public bodies and the department has also provided an update on the 2020-21 in-year reduced requirements, the revised 2021-22 COVID-19 bid and a copy of the Minister's letter to uh, that of the Finance Minister on the draft 2021-22 budget allocation and remaining pressures. So officials will be attending the committee meeting on the 29th of April to outline the final budget position and what the department's priorities are. So this information, uh, members, is here for noting, and then we will uh, pick up the issues at the meeting on the 29th of April, if members are content to note. 
noted. Item 9, then, is the Places of Worship Protection Scheme. The Committee wrote to the Department in September 2020 requesting information on the current position regarding the introduction of a Places of Worship Protection Scheme uh, and what further action could be taken to assist Places of Worship that have experienced attacks following correspondence from Care NI on the subject. The Department advised that work was being carried out to enable the Minister to consider if a scheme similar to that operating in England and Wales and being developed in Scotland, both of which focus on religiously motivated hate crime, is required here. The Department has now provided an update which outlines that the potential for any scheme has developed to take into consideration the needs of other key buildings also targeted by hate crime, including those in rural areas where visible policing as a preventative deterrent may be less effective. The Department has outlined that there are a range of issues to be considered uh, regarding a potential security scheme aimed at ensuring protection of those buildings most vulnerable to attack from hate crime. The Minister has asked officials to give further consideration to the key issues and the intention is to undertake more formal engagement with interested stakeholders to hear their views, consider the benefits and limitations of such a scheme, including broadening the scope beyond places of worship, and consider if a scheme were to proceed how it might be designed and administered. This work will be done in the context of other competing priorities and in particular taking forward the outworkings of Judge Maranin's review of hate crime legislation. The Department will provide a further update regarding a decision on this issue in due course. If members are content, we'll forward a copy of this correspondence um, to CARE and I, which raised it with the committee. Uh, obviously, at this stage, we can note the information um, that has been provided. My own view is this is being kicked into the long grass, um, but however, that's where the department seems to be going with it. Um, but uh, I'm going to pursue that uh, further in due course as well, and we'll see what more information they come back with when a final decision is to taken in respect of it. But if members are content, we'll note the information and we'll forward the correspondence to the relevant organisation that raised it with us. Agreed. Item 10. Uh, the Department, um, and forgive me, it's a little bit lengthy, this one, so um, if you just uh, work with me. Um, the Department of Justice has provided information on the outcome of two consultations relating to judicial pensions and its proposed way forward. The first consultation covered how to address the McLeod judgment findings that the taper protections extended to older judges as part of the 2015 reform of the pensions uh, amounted to direct age discrimination. The second covered reforms of judicial pensions and mirrored proposals made in a Ministry of Justice consultation to resurrect the uh, previous pension scheme for eligible judges and make some modernisations to it in terms of governance and accountability arrangements. No responses were received to either consultation. The Department has indicated that in relation to the McLeod remedy, it intends to proceed with an options exercise whereby those ju judges that have been affected by the McLeod judgment will be given a choice to have accrued benefits from the 1st of April 2015 to the 31st of March 2022 in either the legacy pension schemes that were available for members prior to 2015 or the Northern Ireland Judicial Pension Scheme. This is in line with the approach to be taken by the Ministry of Justice for its judges. It is intended that all eligible judges will be entered into a new judicial pension scheme after April 2022. The cost of the remedy has been estimated at 0.7 million by the Government Actuaries Department, uh, which is a provisional estimate of the projected increase in benefit accrual and is expected to fall to the pension scheme rather than the departmental budget. It does not include costs associated with member contributions or the administrative costs of an options exercise. The Department has also advised that the options exercise in returning judges to legacy schemes will be a significant exercise with practical and legislative elements. In relation to reforms to judicial pensions, the Department has advised that the proposed new scheme will be a career average model with no restriction on the number of accruing years in service. The normal pension age will be linked to the state pension age and members will also be able to commute part of their pension to a lump sum. The Department has advised that the new scheme, which mirrors the reforms being implemented by the Ministry of Justice for accepted courts judiciary in Northern Ireland, is likely to result in an increase in cost of 9% compared to current arrangements. The Ministry of Justice aims to have the reforms implemented from 1 April 2022 
and the Department believes that it would be challenging to replicate the same for the devolved judiciary within this timescale. Any delay would lead to divergence from the pension scheme for the expected court's judiciary and could result in criticism or litigation if devolved judiciary remain in a discriminatory pension scheme for a longer time. There are also concerns regarding the creation of a small devolved scheme in terms of value for money and the administration of such a scheme. The de Department therefore believes that the most cost-effective and reliable option is to be included within the larger Ministry of Justice contract arrangements and advises that the Ministry of Justice, the Department of Finance and the Pension Board of the Northern Ireland Judicial Pension Scheme have indicated support for such an approach. Inclusion in the Ministry of Justice contract arrangements may only be possible if the devolved scheme is created in parallel. Therefore, the Department suggests that the most appropriate route for the legislative changes may be through Westminster legislation, which is subject to the legislative consent of the Assembly. So, members, it's because it's the preferred option being through Westminster rather than here as to why it's been necessary just to go into a lot more detail uh, for members' benefit um, in respect of this issue. So, members, if we are content with the Department's proposals in respect of the McLeod remedy and the judicial pensions uh, reforms, then we can uh, duly note that. Um, and if members are content in principle with the proposal to proceed with the legislative changes by way of an LCM, subject to getting sight of the relevant Westminster legislation, then we can advise the Department accordingly. Are members content on those two aspects of action? Uh, I see Rachel Woods' hand up. Thanks, Chair. It's just by comment. The, the consultations receive no responses. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if that if that's quite normal or if you know this is this is a change to pensions. So I'm just it was just a quite of a, a bit of a comment there in relation to that. You know, is what kind of consultation was undertaken or was it taken undertaken at the wrong time? Or is there, you know, I, I just yeah, it, it, it just didn't sit well with me that pushing ahead with something with no consultation responses and and, and where, where do, does our role sit within that in terms of reflecting um, the needs and wants? But if, a, if there's nobody with any comments, then fair enough. Again, I'm making assumptions here because it's such a very narrow group of people that are affected and they may well have been relatively content with the proposed way forward. It's maybe taken as a nil return as being assent. Uh, I assume usually people will engage when they're not happy with the travel of direction, but that's just my general assumption here on this aspect of it. Um, well, if members are content then in terms of those two areas, um, then we will advise the department accordingly. Obviously, if coming through by way of an LCM, then it will come back to the committee, um, but obviously the, the travel of direction is as Posed by the department. Okay. Item 11, um, mandatory retirement age for devolved judicial office holders. The department has provided the results of a consultation on proposals to raise the mandatory retirement age um, of the devolved tribunal members and lay magistrates in Northern Ireland to either 72 or 75 and to allow appointments to be extended beyond the mandatory retirement age and its proposed way forward. The proposals mirror those in a consultation undertaken by the Ministry of Justice, which directly affects the court's judiciary in Northern Ireland, for whom the Lord Chancellor is responsible. There were a small number of responses to the consultation, which the Department advises were, on balance, favourable towards raising the mandatory retirement age to 75. Concerns were, however, raised by one respondent that increasing the age to 75 would mean the need to make appointments is reduced and may create less opportunity for younger people to apply for the role. The Department believes that the impact is unlikely to be significant. The Lord Chancellor also proposes to change uh, the uh, MRA to 75 for members of the judiciary for which he is responsible, and the Department advises that it is considered desirable to maintain parity with the accepted court's judiciary. The Department has also included that once the MRA has been raised to 75, extensions of appointments um, will not be created. Members of the devolved judiciary will only be able to continue sitting beyond this age to finish hearing a part heard case. 
The Ministry of Justice will put provisions in place to allow fee-paid courts judiciary in Northern Ireland to sit in retirement to equalise their position with salaried counterparts. The Department intends to maintain parity for devolved judicial office holders where they have a salaried equivalent, so eligible judges will be able to uh, apply to sit in retirement uh, on a fee-paid ad hoc basis where there is an exceptional business need which cannot otherwise be met. The Committee has previously considered information on the payment of recruitment and retention allowance to eligible county court judges for the financial year 1st of April to 31st of March 2020 and in accordance with the Lord Chancellor's determination. The Department did not have statutory authority to make the payments, but it had not been possible to identify a suitable vehicle in Westminster to take forward necessary changes to the legislation to close this gap. However, Along with increasing the MRA, the Ministry of Justice is also taking forward other reforms to create the ability to pay allowances, which there is no statutory provision to do so, and new provisions for fee-paid judges sitting in retirement. The Department has suggested that this may be an opportunity to take forward similar provision for devolved judicial office holders, including fee-paid judges sitting in retirement. Uh, a bill will be introduced at Westminster to make the required legislative changes for the judiciary in England and Wales, along with courts judiciary in Northern Ireland as soon as parliamentary time allows, with the intention that the provisions will come into force on 1 April 2022. The Department has concerns that it would not be able to get similar legislation passed within the same time scale here, and that, as with pension reforms, any delay in enacting similar provisions for devolved judiciary may be criticised and creates potential for unjustifiable differential treatment. The Department considers that the timeliest, most, most responsible, er, sorry, most reasonable and proportionate way forward for legislative changes is by Westminster legislation subject to the legislative consent of this Assembly. It also points out that an LCM will be required anyway to cover removals of these judiciary who are to sit in retirement as removals from office is a devolved matter. So again, members, similar to the previous uh, item, if members are content then with the Department's proposals to change the mandatory retirement age to 75, not to extend appointments beyond 75 except to finish hearing a part heard case and make provision for eligible judges to sit in retirement, um, then we can uh, indicate our content to that. If members are agreed and also then content in principle with the proposal to proceed with the legislative changes by way of an LCM, again subject to getting sight of the relevant Westminster legislation. So in both actions, if members are content, we will indicate that to the Department. Content. Rachel, I see your hand up. It was maybe from last time. I'm not sure. Yep, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously, I'd to bear in and just at the start, I hate this, and it's something that I've raised before. But it's just with regard to new recruitment for the lay magistrate. And I had asked the Minister of Justice if there was going to be a new recruitment drive when the next one was, and there's no plans. And I appreciate what the consultation responses have come up with and that the department are, are pressing ahead with the, with the 75. But um, there are more female lay magistrates than there are male. And we only have four lay magistrates that are um, on the age group of 40 to 44 and no lay magistrates under the age of 40. I just have, and I will I'll be continuing on with this despite what's going on with the department go, and, and, and putting that through, that's fine. But we do need to look at, I think at some point, the representative nature of the lay magistrate given their important role and, and, and does, does this represent the communities that we have here and the age range and the population. So it's more of a comment and just to put that on the record, um, it's just it's something that I think we do need to look at, especially given the role of the lay magistrate um, in, our, in our family courts as well. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Just a very quick point, and, and I don't disagree with anything that Rachel has said. However, I suppose I just want to do want to counterbalance that with the fact that under equality legislation, we shouldn't actually have, in my view, or certainly not in our party's view, any upper age limit in terms of our minimum age limit in terms of retirement. I, I think that people should not be discriminated against uh, on the basis of their age. But I, I absolutely accept what Rachel is saying, and I know that's not the point. That she's making and that she would certainly and, and she, she's nodding and <laughs> shaking her head to to agree and disagree i so i, I know there's, there's that's not the point she's making i i agree with her in relation to the fact that there must be that the lay magistrate must be reflective of the community which it serves 
Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Well, listen, when we are indicating uh, the committee's response to the main substance of that item on the agenda, quite happy that we include some commentary of that nature that Rachel and Linda has articulated um, to the department on behalf of the committee. Sinead Bradley. Yeah, Chair, thanks. It's only a very quick comment, and it's just a thought that's come through my mind now. Um, I have no, no disagreement with this, but I am wondering if there's no recruitment and we're extending the age profiler, the retirement, is there a chance that we're creating a later cliff edge and where we don't have then a good pool of experienced lay magistrates? You know, is there, I just wonder, projecting forward what the consequences of this might look like. Um, in, t in terms of the, the profile of magistrates, just a consideration. Yeah. Okay, no, it's a good point, and we'll incorporate that uh, in responding to the department. Okay, then, members, I'll move on to item 12 on the agenda. Um, the Home Office has launched a public consultation seeking views on how the protect duty legislation might be used to enhance the protection of publicly accessible locations across the UK from terrorist attacks and ensure an organisational preparedness to make the public safer. The consultation seeks views from across the UK on a range of questions as national security is a reserve matter but recognises that developing an effective process and support to implement legislation would draw on delivery mechanisms and responsibilities within the devolved administrations. So members, it's there for us to note the consultation at this stage, unless there's any comments members are wishing to make, we will duly note it. Okay, noted. Um, item 13 is the Committee Forward Work Programme. The Department has provided a list of items to business, uh, list of items of business that it would like the Committee to consider at meetings in April and May. The Department has also submitted a request to include a further item covering four proposals for statutory rules connected to the Criminal Finances Act 2017 for consideration at the meeting on the 22nd of April and has provided an SL1 yesterday evening um, for consideration to prescribe a new personal injury discount rate under the powers conferred by Section 1 of the Damages Act uh, 1996 and that would need to be scheduled for the meeting on the 15th of April. Uh, details uh, of that can be found on um, pages 12 to 13 of the uh, table pack. The department is proposing to schedule a written briefing on the key points emerging from the consultation on the development of a joint secure care and justice campus for children on the Woodlands uh, Lakewood site for the meeting of the 22nd of April. Uh, the committee had previously agreed to schedule an oral evidence session with the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People on these proposals and other justice children's issues. The committee had also agreed uh, that we would seek to have an informal meeting with a number of organisations that work with and on behalf of young people who experience the care and or justice system at their request to discuss their concerns regarding uh, proposals uh, as outlined in the consultation document. So members, obviously the department in the first instance is wanting to provide a written uh, briefing paper uh, to the committee on this and if members are content we will uh, consider what further action to take once we have sight of the written briefing and then members we can seek to uh, take forward any other evidence or informal meetings. Linda, you want to come in on that point? Yeah. No, sorry Linda, I think you're still muted. Have you got me now? Yep, yep, that's you. Apologies. You're okay. Um, Thank you, Chair, and, and I actually agree with you that we should wait until we see the written briefing before we we jump to saying we, we definitely need an oral one. Um, the informal meeting with the, the groups, I, I appreciate, should happen after the written briefing as well. I'm just wondering if it would be a suggestion that we do, rather than doing individual informal meetings, a number of those groups, I mean, you will know, have seen from the response to consultation, are very much on the same page in terms of the issues or concerns that they have. So it might be worth maybe looking at the potential to meet a number of them together, just given that, I mean, obviously our time is, is very precious in terms of the legislative program, but I think this is a really, really important issue and I don't want to miss, miss out on picking up any issues that groups and organizations might have. Thank you, Chair. Sinead Bradley. Yeah. 
I think you're still muted, Sinead, if you just want to check. Sorry, Chair, can you hear yep, me? I can okay. Be done now, yep. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. I don't know if I'm jumping in here in the wrong spot, but just in terms of the um the piece that came through about the um from the department that the Secretary of State is going to amend the discount rate. Um just now we briefly went over it and I do wonder we deliberated about the timeline, we were trying to set a quick passage on this that wouldn't um, maybe force the hand of the the permanent secretary. And I'm wondering, does this now have an effect on the pressure or less pressure that might be on the committee? Um, is that a conversation we want to reopen or do we just stick with our timeline? Well, on that, um... <clears throat> know that the motion in the assembly has now been laid in terms of the extension for our consideration of the damages bill obviously the the permanent secretary has reviewed his duty as he sees it um to to keep the rate under active consideration and in doing that has now taken the decision to proceed with uh, laying the appropriate legislation to strike a, a new rate uh, under the wells v wells framework um, at the minus 1.75, which had been consulted upon um, with uh, the Department of Finance and the government actuaries. Um, and that, that's now proceeding in that respect, given the, the Permanent Secretary's decision. Um, for, for, I wasn't going to comment on it at this stage, but from my personal perspective, uh, it's the right decision that's been taken by the Permanent Secretary. Um, it should have been taken six months ago, and I think we could have avoided a lot of unnecessary hostility between the committee and the department had it been done. Um, but in any event, um, you know, my, my principal point here has always been the committee needs to carry out its scrutiny work um, and to carry out that role with due diligence when it comes to legislation. Um, but I, I know that that information has now been communicated to all of the stakeholders um, as well, I think the department issued a letter uh, to all stakeholders um, at 12 o'clock today advising of this action that's been taken by the permanent secretary. So w my view is we, we proceed with the rule that we have to do. What the permanent secretary had to do is something that he's responsible for um, and that ASL1 will, will come forward in due course. Um, but yeah, that's my position, I suppose, on the, on the wider view of it. Thank you, Chair. I no, appreciate that. Um, I just think that the efforts that the committee did go to in terms of trying to find the place where we were being, you know, true to being scrutiny and and also not wanting to force this because the complications it raised. But yes, you're right. I think we just maybe need to just stick to the track we're on at this point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sinead. Okay. Um, Then, if I can, sorry, Christine. Sorry, can I just clarify? Um, go back to the woodlands um, piece. Yeah. Is that the committee is going to consider the written paper, and then we'll schedule the informal meeting. Yeah, and we'll yeah. seek to pull together the wider groups on this, which I think was the plan you had. Yeah, I think they actually wrote all together to us, so yeah. I think that's the way we will approach it. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, I jumped over that piece, but yes. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Okay, then, um, members, the closing date for written evidence on the stocking bill is the 16th of April, and the closing date for written evidence on the damages bill is the 30th of April. Oral evidence sessions on one of the bills will be scheduled for the meeting on the 13th of May. Um, so the committee may wish to reschedule the oral evidence session that we were going to have with Sajini and officials uh, in respect of the report on child sexual exploitation from the meeting on the 20th of May to later uh, in June. That will just enable us to... Um, have some further bill oral evidence sessions that are going to need need to happen to keep us on track with uh, those two bills. So um, if members are content, uh, we will look at uh, rescheduling that oral evidence session um, to June, um, and that will we will then slot in the oral evidence sessions for the stocking bill and the damages bill for Thursday, the twentieth of May, the first of June, the eighth of June, and the fifteenth of June. Um, members are okay with that. Then, 
Again, if members are content, we'll schedule the work items that have been requested by the Department for the meetings in April and May, subject to any changes that have just been agreed, and the Clerk um, can indicate to the Department that further changes may be needed depending on the requirements to progress the committee stages of the bills. Okay, thank you members on that item. Um, correspondence, there's four items of correspondence. Um, and four items uh, in terms of the meeting pack and then there's four items in the table pack. Uh, let me draw attention to one of them. The Department of Justice provides uh, an update on the progress of the working group established to explore implications for the justice system in Northern Ireland for commencing Section 49.1 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009, which was due to report to the Justice Minister by the end of January. Uh, this year, committee members had asked for information on the findings of the working group. The committee had also received correspondence from Sir Geoffrey Donaldson MP on the matter. Uh, the working group has indicated that it requires further time to consider a number of complex issues and resourcing implications, and the Minister has agreed to that. Uh, she is due to meet with the Chair of the group and the presiding coroner in the near future uh, to discuss the issues in more detail. An update will be provided to the committee when the working group has finished its consideration. So, if members are content, we will request further information from the Department on how long the working group needs to consider this matter. And we'll also send a copy of this correspondence to um, Geoffrey Donaldson to update him uh, on terms of the Minister's response. So if members are content, we'll go back to the Department wanting to know how long uh, this requires um, the working group to, to give further consideration to, because I think there's an agreed position on this from the Committee's point of view that uh, we really do want to see this taken forward, and we can emphasise that point um, to the Department. If members are agreed, then we'll do that. Then item one uh, in the table packs, just correspondence from Robbie Butler in respect of uh, his intention to bring forward a private member's bill. Uh, this uh, will increase by statute protection for emergency responders, and that would include prison officers in regard to mental ill health and PTSD developed as a result of their exposure to trauma in their line of duty. And he has provided a link to the consultation on his uh, proposal. So just at this stage, members, if we're content, we'll respond to Mr Butler acknowledging receipt of the correspondence um, and indicating that should this develop into legislation, then obviously the committee will carry out uh, any role that it needs to carry out in terms of um, scrutinising and assisting and, and so on, if members are content with that. Then... Um, just another item in the table pack was correspondence from the Department regarding the launch of the Sexual Offences Legal Advice Pilot. The pilot scheme to provide publicly funded legal aid to complainants in serious sexual offence cases in line with the recommendation of the Gillen Review is to be launched on the 1st of April. Um, the pilot will provide all adult complainants of serious sexual offences access to legal advice from fully qualified sexual offences legal advisors from the point of report to the commencement of the trial. Legal representation directly to the court itself and pre-trial court proceedings will not be included within scope of the first phase, as all the related issues have not been fully resolved. A phased approach is therefore being adopted with a view to resolving the issues and securing agreement to include this in the second phase of the pilot. The intention is that lessons learned from the pilot will also help uh, inform the development of equivalent services tailored for children to be taken forward separately. Uh, the committee will be kept updated on the progress of the pilot and its impact. Um, so, members, that's just there um, for noting. Uh, also, another item, uh, correspondence from the Department advising of the publication of a research bulletin evaluation of support hubs in Northern Ireland. Research bulletin evaluates all operational elements of support hubs, including background approach, clients, programme, lessons learned, and next steps and feedback that was largely positive. So that's there to note. Another item is a copy of a letter from members um, to uh, Rosa to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister and the Minister of Justice requesting action on a range of issues regarding gender violence and the right to protest. The committee has written uh, to the Minister of Justice asking her what steps she intends to take to proceed with the violence against women and girls strategy. So that is a copy of correspondence for noting. And if members are content to action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet um, in respect of the rest of the correspondence, members agreed. I have no business as chairman. Is there any other business members have? If there is no other business, 
then can I thank you very much for attending. Our next meeting is due to be on Thursday, the 15th of April, and that will be at 2 o'clock in the Senate chamber and obviously via Starley for anyone that wishes to, to use that facility. So thank you, members, and I'll adjourn the meeting at this stage. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.